5 to 11 servings of bread, cereal, or rice. What? 3 to 5 of vegetables and 4 of fruits. Is pst, their antioxidants and fiber help you to digest. In the last video, we talked a bit about water and why we need to have clean water. And remember where we actually get our water from. Most of our drinking water comes from either a river or in some cases a lake. And from there, it will be transported from the river or lake via these different types of tubes. And from there, from the tubing, it gets to first before it actually gets to our homes. So before it gets to our homes, it's going to go to a drinking water treatment plant. So why does it have to go to that drinking water treatment plant? That's what we're going to talk about. And I'm quickly going to mention some of the reasons as well first before we start. And I mentioned earlier that the river itself, even though it's quite clean, and obviously the water itself in most cases is quite clean, there can be some soil which might come into the water for erosion, for example. There might be some feces of animals that live close by or in the river. And these feces might be in the river itself. Or there could be pesticides or any different types of chemicals that could have run off into the actual river. So these are some of the reasons why even the river water is usually quite clean, it could still not be perfectly clean. Obviously, if we want to have if we want to have drinking water, we do want to make sure that drinking water is quite clean. So what we can do is before we drink it, we would put it through this drinking water treatment plant, and then distribute it to our actual houses. And this is what we're going to talk about because the actual point says students will gather, process, and analyze information from secondary sources to describe ways in which water drinking can be treated and use available evidence to explain. How these methods reduce the risk of infection from pathogens. There's two parts. First, we had to describe the actual procedure, what happens in a filtration plant, and then we have to explain how that helps us to reduce the risk of infection. That's what we're going to do in this video. And this is this treatment plant, and again, there's two parts. First, we have to talk about how it works, how to outline the procedure, and then how, and the second part is how that actually helps us to reduce the risk of infection. So again, I mentioned earlier that water itself is usually stored at a dam, but then from there it goes through these pipes, and it will travel through these pipes to the actual plant itself. So these were the pipes. And now we're at this step, so we're about to actually enter the plant. And I'll start with the first part. So it says the first part of the plant, we add a coagulation agent. So coagulatant added. And the question is, what exactly does it do? Well, the coagulation actually makes the actual, so you can imagine a soil and a bit of bigger particles being suspended in the liquid, but they're being suspended, so they're not actually that solid yet, but we don't want to have soil particles floating around in our actual water. So as coagulation does, it makes it all come together, it makes it stick together, just like, you know, when we have, for example, when platelets, when they coagulate, what that happens is they all, you know, they heal a wound, so they all come together and they coagulate. That's what coagulation is. It's just if we have different particles spread out, that means they're going to come together and form a bigger mass. Right, so this coagulating coagulate will help doing the, will help do that. But after we've added this coagulation agent, we're going to put it into a flocculation tank. And as you can see, these arrows point in all directions. So what you can imagine is this coagulation will help to bring it together. And by moving it around and around and around and around, what this flocculation tank will do, flocculation tank, it will speed up that. It will speed up the coagulation process. So it will make sure that the soil itself clumps up. So the soil clumps up, and that's important for the second step, which is that the sludge is collected. So now, after the flocculation tank, we can see that the water, so all the soil here, this is the soil part has all coagulated, has clumped up. Now we can simply remove it. So we can remove it in the actual thickener and that is going to be used as compost. But here we're going to talk about what does this sediment sludge collector do? Well in the sludge collector, so in the sludge collector, we can remove sediment. We call it the sediment. Sediment is anything that settles down at the actual bottom. So we remove the sediment. And how is that helpful? Like how is it helpful in preventing disease? Well overall there might be, you know, some crazy stuff in this obviously we generally don't want to drink soil. So the sediment could have 
harmful soil or soil bacteria or they could have harmful chemicals in it. So the sediment is removed, which makes sure which means we don't actually get in contact with these harmful potential pathogens or chemicals or soil particles. So sediment removed, which means the pathogens, some of the pathogens and soil particles will also be removed within that sludge. As is here we first we've described the procedure. You can probably view all of this here as one procedure. First we add the coagulation agent, then it goes into the flocculation tank, then it travels into sludge collector where the sludge is collected, the sediment deposits and removed, and then we have more of a pure water left. So that was that. And then it moves through that into the filtration tank. So the next part was the filtration tank. And what does the filtration tank do? Well, with the filtration tank, we have here we have all the big stuff, you know, the bigger particles have all left, but anything that is too small or it doesn't coagulate out will have still been left. And with the filtration tank, we can make sure that very small particles still get caught. So with the filtration tank, all small particles that are not meant to be there, well, most of them will be, quite a few of them will be caught. So we say filtration tank was how it works. We did these filters, filter out anything which is, it's like a filter net, so anything that's small enough to pit, fit through that filter net will pass to the next level. Anything too big will stay up and be filtered out. How does it help us to reduce the risk of infection? Well, again, there could be some harmful, harmful chemicals or bacteria, especially these are usually the protozoa. Protozoa. And these are usually quite big, so they're a bit bigger than bacteria, and they can be used, they can be filtered out using this filtration. So these protozoa will be filtered out using this filtration device, and that means there's less infection happening. Next step is also really important. Next step is disinfection. So call it disinfection. And what happens is we actually add some chlorine. So the majority of plants use chlorine. So they add chlorine. And what does this chlorine do? Well, this chlorine is a chemical itself, and it will attack all different types of bacteria. So we add chlorine here at this stage. Why do we do it? Well, this chlorine itself will actually kill bacteria, quite a few bacteria, which means we can make sure that our water itself is free of bacteria. And then we also, what we can still do with that same step, is we can add fluorine. So we add chlorine to so disinfect, but we can also add fluorine. And fluorine itself is actually quite beneficial. So fluorine is good for us. And so we add fluorine in this step, and then why do we add it? Because fluorine helps us to protect from, helps our teeth, and it protects from plaque. So it protects from plaque. We know that people who have consumed fluorine throughout their life are a lot lower risk of damage to the teeth for plaque and decay and people who have not had that. In many cases we make sure we put fluorine into our drinking water, tap water, so that people will actually get there without even looking, caring about it. They'll just drink it as they go. So these are the major steps. So you should remember the procedure and why we do it. And remember that look you, know, you should also know the stock kind of diagram and know its different steps. So I think that we probably can put them into three or four different steps. This step here where we have the coagulation and a fluctuation tank, we can call that step one. Remember what happens here? Here, this coagulation, I add an, a coagulation agent, make sure that soil clumps up. This flocculation tank to make sure that the soil clumps up even faster. This was the first step. The second step here is where then, after it's all clumped up, the soil can be removed quite easily and used as, for example, as compost. And then the next step is where this travels, anything that's left travels for filtration. That was the third step. And what the good thing about filtration is we can make sure we can remove any particle which is too big. And in many cases we said these protozoa, which are not a bacteria, they're a bit bigger than bacteria, but they can still be a pathogen. They are removed through this step. Anything that's too small will still pass. Most bacteria will pass and go to the next step. That's why we have that fourth step, which was disinfection and adding of chlorine. Chlorine. We said that the chlorine that we added killed the bacteria. So now there's no more bacteria left, no more no more protozoa left, it's quite clean. But what we can still do at that fourth step is add some fluorine. The reason why we do that is because fluorine helps to protect against plaque 
and plaque itself is also a disease. It's infection of bacteria. Right? So remember those four steps. Remember the procedure, but also remember how it helps us protect us in terms of protecting our body. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.